This is part three and the final video for our microfungi lecture. Here we are going to look at the glomeromycota, and these are united by this characteristic of being endomycorrhizal. It's possible that some of these lineages within glomeromycota are not endomycorrhizal, but the ones that you'll see um, and how we'll talk about them is in reference to this being endomycorrhizal. So what does that mean? That means that they colonize the roots of most plants. Approximately 90% of plants form mycorrhizal relationships, and most of those are this endomycorrhizal type. So the fungus helps the plant obtain nutrients and water, and it receives sugars in exchange. So here is this fungus growing within the plant root. The fungal tissue is stained this dark black blue color, and the plant root is here. So you can see individual plant cells as these kind of boxes, and they have fungal tissue growing inside of them. So they are um, sometimes called the vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or just arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And that's because of these structures they make. The vesicles are the large blobs, and the arbuscules, think about Arbor Day, are these highly branched, shrubby looking structures. So they look like little trees, which is where that arbor term comes from. So arbuscule means mini tree, and it is a highly branched hypal structure that forms within the plant cell wall, but outside of the plasma membrane. So this branching allows for more surface area for exchange, and the plant will take water and nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, dissolved compounds that the fungus can scavenge from the soil, and those will go into the plant, and the fungus will be taking sugars from the plant because fungi can't make their own food. So this is a way that fungi can get food without having to go find it all the time. And they are helping the plant by accessing parts of the soil that the plant can't get to because it has these like fat roots that can't get into the fine soil pores. So this increases the amount of surface area that plant roots have by an incredible degree. So here we have a plant root system shown in yellow, and the mycorrhizal fungi are shown in purple. See how much finer they are than the plant roots and how much more expansive they are. On the left side here, we have plants that are grown with and without mycorrhizal fungi. The ones on the left have mycorrhizal fungi, and the ones on the right don't. Same species of plant grown in the same conditions, but with mycorrhizal fungi, plants grow bigger, better, are more able to devote their energy toward forming tissues because they have more nutrients to do that. They have more access to nitrogen and phosphorus. Phosphorus is the major limiting component to plant growth. and Nitrogen is the thing that plants need the most of. Chlorophyll is very nitrogen rich, so they need a lot of nitrogen um, to grow, to build, to do photosynthesis. Okay, so that's a big role of glomeromycota. They are a very mysterious group because normally to study things you grow them in a culture, but these are obligate intracellular organisms. They live inside the roots of plants, so you can't study them without the plants because most of them won't grow and you can't culture them. So very difficult to study, very strange. We know very little about their um, like how they reproduce. Okay, let's look at molds as our last group of microfungi. Molds are fungi reproducing asexually. Most fungi are capable of reproducing asexually. It's something interesting about fungi. Whenever they're doing that, no matter what group they're in, we call that a mold. So that term mold just re refers to fungi reproducing asexually. Some fungi can do both asexual and sexual reproduction. Some we've only seen the asexual stage or only the sexual stage. So it's part of how we identify them um, are by these structures. A lot of fungi have two names because we discovered the mold. We discovered the sexual structure, which might be a mushroom or something, and we named them both something different because they don't look the same. Then we found out genetically, they're the same. So, complicated. So they reproduce asexually by making spores by mitosis. So it's a type of cell division where you clone the parent cell and make an identical copy. So these spores reproduce by mitosis. In some groups, like ascomycetes and basidiomycetes, they're called conidia. In the lower groups of fungi, like the zygomycetes, we might just call them mitospores, spores made by mitosis. 
they'll be haploid because we're cloning a haploid mycelium. So here are some examples. We have, um, I'll put myself down here, we have penicillium, which makes these beautiful paintbrush-like um, mold structures. So this is called the conidia four because that ending for P-H-O-R-E means to bear. So these structures bear the conidia, these um, asexual spores. So these conidia fours are producing conidia and they're beautiful under the microscope. I encourage you to look at molds with your microscope. It's difficult because they are hydrophobic. Um, so if you mount them in water, they just disperse and you don't get to see any of this nice connected structure. So you can dry mount them to look at them. And then after you've looked at them dry, then you can add KOH, which is slightly less uh, disturbing to them than water. Um, so it's a, a good way to look at them. But this is what it looks like macroscopically, just like um, kind of minty green fuzz growing on an orange. So if you have citrus that has this sort of greenish color, you can look at that mold under the microscope for your fungal lab. It's probably Penicillium digitatum. The first antibiotic was discovered in the mold Penicillium chrysogenum. That's where the term penicillin comes from. Um, and it was an accidental discovery, but it was found that uh, these molds were making antibacterial compounds because they killed the bacteria in this petri plate. So that's where the first antibiotics came from. Other penicillium species are famous for their ability to change the texture and flavor of milk and meat. So we can make cheeses and cured meats like salami. So Roquefort, uh, or Roquefort um, is from Penicillium roquefortii. That's that blue cheese with the veins running through it. And then Camembert is Penicillium camembertii, um, which grows just on the outside rind. And there's another one, um, two, that they've discovered in salami. There was this original one, um, and then they recently, I think, discovered a second one that was present in all of the salami being made, I think, in Italy. I should read about that again, so I'm not spreading you false facts, non-facts. And I wanted to show you this diagram because it's super interesting. So the mold grows in that sort of coating on the outside, the rind, and as it penetrates into the cheese, the milk, it changes its texture, it changes its flavor, it changes the pH, changes the compounds that are present. So the, the metabolism of the fungus is altering this milk product in different ways so it makes different cheeses with different fungi. So here's kind of an example of what's going on. Your different pH gradients and why it changes the texture of the cheese, um, what's being produced in different areas, and this sort of complex structure that is cheese. Fascinating. And here is another type of mold. So the two most common ones you'll see are penicillium and aspergillus. Aspergillus tends to be darker in color, but not always. They can be um, fluffy and green as well. But they'll have this swollen structure at the end. You can see it here. And then they make their spores sort of all around it. So less of a paintbrush and more of like a, I don't know, big cool afro. Um, so here's some aspergillus spores. So it's a common mold on breads. It, you can be found on citrus. Um, this one is used, um, this genus of molds is used to um, make citric acid. It's used to um, ferment, to make soy sauce. Um, miso, I think is also, yeah, and sake. So a lot of commercial uses for molds that we'll go over um, in the macrofungi lecture. Okay, that's the end of microfungi. So now you know some things to go look for for your labs. Find moldy fruit. Find weird bugs that look fuzzy. <laughs> and look at them under the microscope. Also, you should be looking in aquatic environments for fungal-like things to look at.